Hello. Welcome to this course on environmental and natural resource economics. My name is uh, Timo Kosmanen. I'm a professor of economics at uh, Turku School of Economics, uh, University of Turku in, in Finland. And uh, this course is uh, taught as an uh, intermediate level economics course at our school. Uh, but I will also post these uh, video lessons uh, for anybody interested in the in the topic. So uh, in the first uh, video lesson, I will give a brief introduction, try to give you a feeling of what is environmental economics. Uh, I talk about some issues such as uh, population growth and the so-called environmental Kuznets curve uh, hypothesis. Uh, and briefly also the importance of uh, environmental economics currently in the in the Finnish media. So firstly about the definition of, uh, of what is environmental economics. So I took this kind of uh, um, a brief description from uh, Wikipedia. So uh, environmental economics can be seen as a subfield of uh, economics, uh, which is concerned with the environmental issues such as uh, air pollution, water pollution, and of course, nowadays, uh, uh, the global warming is, is uh, perhaps the number one environmental issue. So the connection to the, to the, between the economy and the environment, uh, uh, you might, of course, wonder that why, why uh, economics is needed to understand uh, environmental issues. And um, here is the the figure that I took from the from, from the introductory textbook, uh, the economy produced by the by the core group, and you can find also the link to the textbook and the on the bottom of this page if you are interested. So uh, this uh, this describes the the model of the economy. And uh, the microeconomic theory, of course, focuses mainly on firms and households as this uh, economic agents. But also notice in this in this introductory figure also the connection to the biosphere and the physical environment is also very very clearly indicated. So this is this green box that is drawn around the firms and households in this kind of kind of illustrative figure. So obviously, of course. Um, uh, economic agents, um, firms and households, they, they you take land, raw materials, energy, water from the physical environment. Uh, so this is uh, described by this green, green arrows. Um, and then also both firms and households use the, the, the biosphere as to, to dump their pollution and waste. So the point here is to illustrate that, uh, that of course, the, the, um, Economic activities are often often the source of the environmental problems, and uh, in that sense, it's very useful to understand also the the motivations and rationale of of how firms are behaving, how households are behaving, in order to solve this kind of environmental issues. Because um, one could argue that no firm or no household is is um, polluting on purpose just be, just because they are mean. But rather, there are these kind of economic incentives uh, driving their behavior, and then also by by changing the incentives, it's also possible to 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 give uh, better incentives to avoid pollution and waste, and also use uh, raw materials, energy, and uh, other resources in a more sustainable fashion. So this is why I would argue that understanding uh, economics is very very important to to be able to. Uh, conduct uh, effective environmental policies uh, to, to address these environmental issues that we are facing today. So here's a similar figure which is adopted from the um, environmental economics textbook by uh, Perman et al., which I will, I will, uh, I will use uh, as, a, as a main source for this course. And the authors of the of the permanent al textbook have also further adapted it from the Herfindahl and Nies uh, in 1974, as indicated by the reference. So this is very similar similar figure as the one that I presented uh, um, before. However, here is a little bit more 
um, detailed focus on this, particularly to this kind of uh, material flows and, and this economy cycle that um, in, in contrast to the previous figure, now the firms have been divided to two parts. So in the center of the figure, there are so-called environmental firms, such as farms, mines, uh, fishing firms. So this is this kind of like a, a primary production sector, so to speak. And then there is this non-environmental firms such as factories, stores, transport. So those are more this kind of processing industries and services where this, uh, which use this uh, products of the environmental firms as their, as their raw material. So this can, gives a little bit uh, more detailed picture of, uh, of these different types of material for, for material flows, uh, also, also possibilities of, of recycling. So these two figures are just meant to be illustrating the, the connections of the economic activity and the, and the natural environment. And of course, a big source of the environmental problems is that the, the economy has been growing in terms of the volume, and this is very much related to the to the population growth. So I took this um, rather recent um, United Nations World Population Prospect from uh, from uh, uh, 2019. So uh, the human population uh, reached 7.8 billion in in 2020. So and and as you can see from this uh, this diagram, the, the population growth has been uh, really fast, at least since nineteen uh, fifties. Uh, and of course, this kind of uh, additional population uh, means that there's also also more economic activity, and that puts a, a greater burden on the on the natural environment. So so definitely, the population growth is. Uh, the underlying source of many, many different types of uh, environmental issues and challenges that we face today. And uh, there is also a lot of uncertainty uh, how the human population at global level will, will then develop uh, from now on. So this, uh, this uh, light blue colored uh, area in this figure is illustrating this uncertainty that uh, if the population growth continues at the same rate as it has been in the past uh, past decades, then then the human population might double still by by year uh, two thousand one hundred. On the other hand, there's also also possibility that uh, or, or there are also some uh, more promising signs that the, the population growth is or growth rate is is uh, slowing down. So perhaps the peak of the population might be uh, seen by 2050s and then then the human population might be might be decreasing so this is of course very very fundamentally important also for the for the environmental challenges that we are facing today and and there of course the the um, uh, challenge of the population growth is also also very very much related to the uh, for example issues in the development economics so how can the economists then, then address, for example, the, the issues such as population growth? So in this diagram, I have taken from the, from the, from the permanent Al book, uh, uh, illustrating the, the microeconomics of fertility choices. So in this figure, there is the number of children in the family unit on the horizontal axis, and then there is so-called price of children on the on the vertical axis, and uh, and then there's two two lines that cross. They are MC and MB. MC denotes uh, marginal cost, and MB is marginal benefit. So you might find there if you have studied some uh, some introductory economics course, it's very similar to this kind of supply and demand uh, curves that uh, that then determine the the market equilibrium. Here we have these marginal benefits and marginal costs uh, of, of, uh, of a child. So consider a, um, a family in a, in a, in a, a country where the, where the government support is very, very minimal. So there's not any, any uh, child benefits or, or pension system. 
so so that uh, children in the family then are serving as a very important uh, source of labor and uh, perhaps not only in in uh, in the household labor but also also earning income uh, uh, outside of home and if there is uh, not very that if, if there is not uh, not uh, uh, well developed pension schemes then for example parents are thinking ahead for their future that who is taking care of the parents when they are aging and cannot anymore take care of themselves so if there is not any if the if the if there's no pension schemes if the if the government is not taking care of elderly people then obviously then then um, parents will invest in their children so that the children would then take care of them as as the parents are aging so this type of benefits uh, the, the source of uh, uh, of labor force and also also taking care of the aging parents uh, is that some of the benefits that uh, that influence this uh, shape of the marginal benefit curve. But then we can think about the marginal costs. Of course, um, of course, if you if you have a, an additional mouth to to feed, then of course uh, costs are costs are increasing. But not only that, of course, then then uh, capacity of the of the um, of the dwelling the house or apartment will will be more limited as as there are more and more children perhaps you need to move to a bigger house uh, you may might need a bigger bigger uh, forms of transportation more more bicycles or bigger car and so on and so on so the marginal costs are also also increasing however according to this diagram the marginal cost is is not increasing very very rapidly in the in the high income countries, this uh, marginal cost could increase much more rapidly as as uh, as uh, you would need a, a bigger car or bigger house when you have uh, have more more children. So the idea here is that the, the parents are maximizing the 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 benefit minus cost. So in some sense, you want to maximize the uh, area that is. Uh, is between this MB and MC curve. So, so what is the area between the MB and M MC curve? And, and it's easy to see from the figure that this, uh, this uh, uh, area contained uh, between MB and MC, so it's benefit minus costs. Uh, so this area becomes largest when the number of children is equal to this uh, uh, CH asterisk indicated in the, in the figure. And this also then indicates this kind of um, uh, equilibrium price for the children so it is p asteric so i don't mean to suggest that uh, the parents are necessarily um, uh, thinking about this kind of optimization problem uh, uh, co consciously or 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 thinking about it um, before before deciding to make children However, this kind of kind of uh, incentives and market forces in play are are still uh, guiding the the or creating incentives for the for incentives for the households, and and also they they also then influence the societal values that how society is valuing the how large uh, uh, large families expected. So it might also not necessarily influence just the just the parents, but also perhaps grandparents and the and the larger family, and what kind of societal expectations are, are given to the to the parents. So now, of course, uh, the similar kind of kind of expectations we we face also in the high income countries such as Finland, uh, and uh, here we are perhaps more worried about this kind of low fertility rate that uh, that what is happening to the in the in the in the future that do we have enough. Uh, enough uh, next generations uh, to 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 um, support labor force to our economy and and pay our our pensions and so on so similar kind of incentives of course could be influencing uh, fertility decisions also in the high income countries where where the equilibrium for the for the number of children is is usually relatively low perhaps lower than lower than two so, so this is not necessarily just the situation in the in the developing countries, but also also in the high income countries. The incentives uh, uh, could be then influenced, or, or or the number of children could be influenced uh, uh, by policy decisions. For example, 
uh, government could pay some some uh, subsidies for for families with children to influence this uh, this uh, marginal benefits of the of having a having a child. So this figure is main, mainly to to illustrate that also the there's uh, underlying economic uh, rationale uh, that can drive also this kind of fertility decisions which can influence the in, influence the population growth at the at the global level and of course a very important issue here is also that uh, uh, what is the status of women in the, in the society and in the family that uh, that uh, do for example girls have access to the to the education uh, can can uh, when what what kind of uh, uh, power women have in in uh, deciding this uh, or making fertility decisions so this is also also very important to consider so that's an illustrative uh, illustrative example of how relatively simple uh, economics can also also give some insights to the to the such issues as uh, as fertility so so my point here is to highlight that the economic theory can be used also in other contexts it doesn't have to be necessarily always just uh, related to some kind of monetary decisions or some kind of uh, explicit markets so then let me let me also connect to another another issue then then that kind of relates to also this uh, this um, population growth and uh, and uh, development over time so there is this um, quite famous and and also quite heavily debated uh, um hypothesis called environmental kuznets curve so this uh na name of this uh, this hypothesis refers to the uh famous economist simon kuznets who who uh, suggested this kind of inverse u-shaped relationship between um uh, economic uh, inequality and and uh, and uh, level of the uh, economic development so it was not in the context of the environmental uh, environmental uh, issues originally however similar kind of uh, Kuznets curve type of thinking can be also and has been suggested in the context of environmental issues so consider this uh, top, top figure so here is a uh, there is a uh, Two types of uh, air pollution. So, uh, if if we consider these these two top figures first, then then uh, those would be in in favor of the of the environmental Kuznets curve hypothesis. So so we have there the uh, per capita income uh, on the horizontal axis, and then we have some kind of quantitative measures of uh, of air pollutant concentrations on the on the vertical axis. And there is on the top left, we have uh, uh, urban concentrations of particulate matter, so particle emissions. So this is this is kind of uh, carcinogenic uh, uh, air pollutant. Uh, so it's literally just some small, small uh, pieces of of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of any any matter that can can get to the lungs and cause, for example, lung cancer. Uh, on the on the top right corner, there is the the sulfur dioxide, which is also a, a air pollutant. Uh, it can be causing, for example, the acid rain. And uh, here is this kind of um, evidence from from cross country regression analysis, uh, uh, where where this kind of relationship between uh, economic wealth in terms of uh, per capita income and and this environmental quality in terms of these air pollutants and uh, for these particularly kind of low low local air pollutants uh, there seems to be some support for the this kind of uh, inverted u-shaped curve that uh, that uh, uh, in some sense the the environmental problem is is uh, is worse at this kind of uh, middle income uh, country group so 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 the the poorest countries um and the richest countries have the have the best uh, uh, air quality according to that study and whereas then it's kind of middle income countries where the where the 
and this kind of um, industrial development has uh, has already taken place but uh, but uh, it's still uh, still in the in the process of development that uh, that where the environmental problems are are, are biggest so if we have this kind of inverted u shape uh, relationship that would of course have very powerful implications for the for the economic development so if that that was really the case then then uh, in some sense uh, um, we could think about the, the pollution problem as some kind of temporary thing in the, in the process of industrialization and as the countries uh, develop uh, and become richer then then they will also pay more attention to the environmental issues and also invest more in the in the cleaner technology and abating the pollution. So, so therefore, then that would give this kind of indication that uh, that uh, economic growth is not bad, but actually uh, countries should actually strive for even even greater economic development. So that this would be then then solving the solving the environmental problems. But indeed, uh, the evidence uh, for this environmental Kuznets curve hypothesis is rather mixed, and then also depends on what kind of kind of pollutants we are thinking about. So, if we then look at the bottom diagrams of this figure, so there is similarly uh, per capita income on the on the horizontal axis, but then there's a bottom left corner looks at the municipal waste per capita, and bottom right is carbon dioxide emissions per capita. So of course, carbon dioxide emissions are very closely related to the to the global warming. So the greenhouse uh, uh, green carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas and contributing to the to the climate change. So at least uh, at the time of the study, there seemed to be very very um, strong uh, positive uh, relationship between. Uh, Per capita income and the and the and the uh, amount of waste generated by by both municipal waste and and uh, and uh, CO two emissions. So this, of course, it's it's possible that uh, that uh, if you think about the shape of the curves, that that uh, that uh, when when the income level gets even higher, that perhaps this curves would uh, would eventually turn down. But uh, the problem is that perhaps the the um, limits of the of this uh, this uh, planet that we live in uh, are achieved earlier than this uh, this uh, curve becomes downward shaping. So indeed, uh, it does not uh, it does not seem that uh, that uh, uh, economic growth as such is is a solution to all of the environmental problems. Perhaps to some, but but. Uh, not not all of them and uh, there is of course very different issue if it is a local pollutant uh, such as uh, such as this particulate matter or sulfur dioxide where this kind of you can feel the environment you can feel the quality of the air and if you compare to this kind of carbon dioxide emissions which is really a global pollutant so so you don't necessarily feel this kind of uh, immediate effect of this pollution so, immediately in your in your neighborhood but uh, but uh, it still contributes to the to the uh, climate change at the global level so these are some of the the type of issues also where where the the uh, environmental economics can help to help to shed light on the on the on the economic problems and it's it's good to know this term uh, environmental kuznets curve that what is what is meant by by that so finally, I com complete this um, kind of motivating lecture with some examples uh, I took from the from the Finnish uh, media. So so these are from the uh, Finnish Ule, Ule News, uh, some of the some of the headlines uh, in English. So um, indeed, this kind of uh, kind of uh, um, climate change and and uh, policy measures uh, are very very much on the, in the, on the visible in the Finnish news and also on the government agenda. So, for example, Finnish government has has uh, declared its intent to be the first country to achieve carbon neutrality by year 2035. So, so that is very very ambitious um, 
very ambitious target. And also there are, are uh, notable environmental economists that are, are, are also involved in this kind of kind of uh, both advising the government, but also also sometimes criticizing the the government. So so for example, um, the the head of the the Finnish climate panel is uh, Professor Marko Ollikainen, who is, is uh, one of the most famous uh, environmental economics uh, economists in Finland. And here in the news is also cited by name uh, Marita Laukkonen, who is another. Uh, notable Finnish environmental economist, so so she has been here criticizing the government for the for the lack of of uh, substance or, or lack of uh, concrete policy measures that how these kind of ambitious targets are are supposed to be met. Then of course, uh, if, if, so we have mainly focused now on environmental issues, but of course environmental issues are also very closely re related to the to the natural resources. And uh, one of the issues is, of course, how do we make this kind of energy transition away from the fossil fuels to, to more cleaner and sustainable energy? And uh, I also took here on the right side this kind of more, more optimistic note that, uh, that uh, already 10% of, uh, of uh, Finland's electricity production was by, by wind power. And indeed, uh, this... Uh, uh, the, Electricity production by by wind power has been very rapidly increasing and and also is is likely to continue to increase in the in the near future. And this also, of course, requires all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, policy measures and policy interventions to 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 uh, in, introduce. But also, for example, these electricity grids and and uh, security of supply and electricity are also also closely related to the. To this kind of kind of uh, very rapid uh, uh, transition from uh, from fossil fuels to, to to cleaner energy. So indeed, uh, environmental economics is uh, uh, very hot at the moment in, in in Finland, and also also I would argue that um, it, even even if you're uh, not really specializing in environmental economics, but but any economist uh, should have some kind of feeling about uh, uh, on some kind of understanding of the of for example uh, climate change climate policy energy policy energy issues because these are really like at the uh, of really current interest uh, uh, and not only from the point of view of the environment but also from the point of view of the economy and government policy So this completes the first uh, lesson. So in the next uh, video lesson, I will discuss um, some of the historical roots of the of the environmental economics in the in the in the field of economics. Thanks, and see you in the next video. Bye bye.